connecting God with what God's doing in my heart and in my life, and it doesn't connect as directly to what we're doing, but it does. Um, some of the stuff that I've been reading and thinking on this last couple weeks has been uh, part of a book that I'm reading, and it's the idea that God is close to us. I think sometimes, I don't know for, about y'all, but I know for me, there have been times that I felt like God was like out there, but he has this fog of omnipresence right around me, <laughs> you know? Like he's there, but he knows what's happening here. More like eyes in your back of your head parenting. You know what I mean? I'm aware of what's happening, but I'm not really there. What God has been challenging me with this last few weeks is that he's right here. He's right here, but he's also right here. When I'm sitting and I'm praying, I'm not praying to someone way out there. You know what I mean? I'm praying to someone who's right here with me. Like he could have his arms around me that kind of close. And there's something so different about considering that instead of thinking him as distant. You know what I mean? And I just, I, I'd encourage you as you think about this Jesus that we're learning about, remember that this Jesus who did, who, who opened the eyes of the blind, who walked on water, this Jesus who made water into wine and who died sacrificially, servant of all, without ever considering himself. That guy, he's right here. He's right here with you, and he loves you. The whole, all of it is yours, and it's accessible to him. Let's pray and get started, but we have to pray tonight. Father, thank you so very much that you're here, that you're here amongst us, that you're here with us, and we love you. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts us today and change us. Help us to grab onto your truth, reject the world's lies, and move forward in you. We love you and we thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, like most people back in the 1980s, and uh, if you were around back then, I was a big fan of Indiana Jones movies, right? Uh, and uh, the last one was called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, if you remember that. And if you remember anything about the story, the whole thing was that they were on a quest to find the Holy Grail, which in their uh, mythology was the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper. And according to them, it was supposed to, anybody who drank from it would give them eternal life. And so as you go through the whole story, finally you get to the end of the story. If you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, but it's old, so you should have seen it. <laughs> but uh, both the good guys and the bad guys arrive at the cave, and they encounter this ancient knight from the 13th century who apparently had eternal life. But he'd been guarding all of these cups that were set out on this tall stone table. And so they uh, come up, and the bad guys uh, and the good guys are all there, and the, the knight looks at them and says, you know, choose wisely from all the cups that are out in front of you. And so the bad guy pushes out of the way, and he's going to go first, and his advisor says, oh, he picks up one from off the table, beautiful, golden, lots of jewels, and he's like, this is the one that would have been Jesus' cup. He's the king of kings. This was what he would drink from. So the bad guy grabs the cup, throws it back, and then after a brief, you know, pause, he melts away in vintage Spielberg fashion into a skeleton, and then the ancient knight looks at Indiana Jones, and he says he chose poorly. <laughs> and so our text today from the Gospel of Mark uh, narrates the final episode in uh, his ministry before he enters Jerusalem for the Passion Week to do the, uh, the Father's will, that is to pay for the sin of all the, wor of the world, like uh, we saw in verse 45 at the end of last week, he will actually give his life as a ransom for many. And the three stories in chapter 10, if you read the whole thing, it kind of looked like they're random, right? It's like, so we got this one guy who's a rich new ruler, and then we got this this weird conversation between James and John about being the greatest and sitting on his left and right, and then we have he and the other blind man. But remember now, remember we learned Mark is very streamlined in what he says. 
and the way he says, and he's not one for randomness, and so he's very deliberate about how he lays out his letter, what he includes and what he doesn't include. And so instead of seeing these incidents, at, in, incidents as disjointed, uh, as, you know, sections that don't paint and that don't re relate to each other, we as readers need to look for the connection that is there. And uh, what made sense to me as I was studying it is around the questions that were posed in the, all three of the stories. And in the previous two, two stories that we looked at the last two times, uh, Jesus interacted with people around a similar idea which was posed to the rich man which and the sons of Zebedee who sought him out. And uh, essentially, this question is the same. What do you want me to do for you? Now, that, that question is not uh, it's specifically that with the rich young ruler, but he was looking for the answers. And so in both incidences, like in a movie, they choose, the first two they chose poorly. And then today we'll see a man who chose wisely. And so we're up to the end of chapter 10 and Mark. And so let's jump into our verses right away. And um, so first he says here in verse 46 is that they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples together with a large cloud that they were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And so Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And to Calvary, remember last week that we talked about that he had set out there with such determination and such focus that the disciples were amazed by this. And the other people that were with him had some fear about it. So there was something about his demeanor that caught their attention as he heads off toward Jerusalem. Now, they were not the only ones headed to Jerusalem. Their, their Passover is about to happen. And so there are great throngs of people who are all headed into Jerusalem right now. And uh, so this large group of people were sidetracked by this man named Bartimaeus. And as it says there, it is son of Timaeus. Remember we talked about before the word bar means son of. So it's very unusual for Mark to include the name of the people that Jesus healed in his letters. But in this case, Timaeus must have been somebody who was known to his readers. And, or some notable person in the area, probably. And, and since blindness was fairly common during this time, this would have given his, he gave his name, so it would distinguish him from other blind people who have maybe have been on the road there. Because it was really common for the poor and sick people and, and destitute people to line the streets of Jerusalem or other major cities begging for money from people who were traveling. And uh, so you couldn't really avoid beggars because, you know, the roads, you know, there's only so many roads that went in and out. And so it'd be like, uh, so they gathered here because there's, it was more likely they'd get money, right? It's like you go down to Mercedes Benz for a football game or, or to a concert or something. You know, when you get off the exit, off the highways, you're going to see a lot of people with signs and asking for money because it's increased their, their likelihood because it's going to be highly trafficked, right? I mean, you don't ask for money on a street where nobody goes. You're not going to get anything. So the sick and disabled would line up along the streets there. And um, now in that day, these kinds of people were especially shunned because the Jewish mindset was that if something was wrong with you or you had a hard time in some way, that God was cursing you. That so you, you know, either you had sinned or your parents had sinned or somebody around you, and then that you, it was your fault. And so, so there wasn't any like orphanages, there weren't any uh, you know, places where you could go for refuge. Begging was really the only way that you had to provide for yourself. So when, when he heard it, that's Bartimaeus, that Jesus of Nazareth, it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, up until this point in God, Mark's gospel, no one has ever called Jesus the son of David. For the first century, Jesus this was huge for them because the term son of David was reserved specifically for the Messiah. And he is clearly addressing Jesus as the heir of David's throne, the one who would fulfill the Davidic covenant that God had made with him, that he would provide someone to be on the throne forever. And that's from 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. And this is a twofold promise. Firstly, in the short term, it would be about his son Solomon. But in the long term, 
He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish his kingdom forever. He's talking specifically about the Messiah. So calling Jesus the son of David is a bold and very uh, public declaration. And it's probably the reason why in the next couple of verses you see them telling him to be quiet. Because they would have, because they would have opposed someone, anyone, uh, giving the title Son of David to Jesus or anybody else because of its implications. So you remember back earlier in the gospel, uh, in, early in the gospel, that, that uh, Peter rightly identifies Jesus as uh, Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this. But here, Bartimaeus announces it, and he doesn't tell him to be quiet at all. Another thing to notice is that uh, it was the Old Testament prophecy that Messiah would heal the blind. That was one specific thing that people looked for, forward to Jesus doing. And Jesus is the only person in Scripture who healed blindness anywhere else. They had one thing about Ananias removing the scales from Paul's eyes, but that's completely different, not somebody who's born blind. Um, so, so that, and Jesus, in Jesus' recorded miracles, this is the thing that he did the most often, seven times in the Gospels, he healed somebody who was blind. So, and here's two examples of the prophecy of the Old Testament about what Messiah would do. Uh, Isaiah, then the eyes of that blind would be opened, ears of the deaf unstopped, and then the lame will leap, leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. And then in Psalms, uh, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Now, remember that the miracles that Jesus did were not just to make people better. The primary reason that Jesus did miracles was to reveal himself as the promised Messiah. So healing blind was part of this Old Testament prophecy. Stuff's trying to fall off. <laughs> and uh, so it was common knowledge that that's what Messiah would do when he showed up and something that they would look for. Now, Remember, if I'm talking specifically about Bartimaeus, he's never seen a miracle. He's never followed Jesus around likely to hear him preach or teach because it would be traveling for a blind person would be far, far too risky. Uh, he, they would be easy target for robbers, uh, you know, who hid and attacked people along the routes between the cities. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? That's what happened. You know, if you were not careful, you travel with a group, you could be easily marked for a uh, to be assaulted. And so uh, the level of faith, faith that this man presents here is based only what he's heard other people say. And so when he hears Jesus is passing by, he's not quiet. He opens his mouth and he calls out in faith. And uh, many people rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And so Bartimaeus shouts out. People don't want him to say anything. They know exactly what he's saying and want him to be quiet. Bartimaeus doesn't back down. And it's interesting that Mark doesn't record that anyone else in this scene joins in with him. I mean, this, this street would have been lined up with all kinds of people with all kinds of problems. And he doesn't say, well, they joined in and some other blind people called out or anything else. He's the only one who speaks up. And as Jesus always does, he rewards the expressions of faith. Jesus stopped. He said, call him. Now, those first two words right there, Jesus stops, are actually pretty powerful, right? Je remember that Jesus has headed to the cross in a little over a week. You know, he knows what's going on. He knows that the payment, uh, his whole reason for being here and the payment for the sins of the world is about to happen and with this very most important appointment to be kept, Jesus has time to stop for a blind man. Somebody nobody cares anything about. We saw this once before when uh, Jesus was going with Jairus to heal his daughter. Jesus, uh, Jairus is a very important man. And then the woman with the issue of blood reaches out, touches the hem of the garment of, of his garment, and he has time to stop and talk to her. As well, Jesus always responds to expressions of faith. So Jesus calls him, and then he says, uh, "Cheer up, get on your feet." He's calling you, throwing away his throwing his cloak aside. He jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, at first glance, uh, Bartimaeus throwing off his cloak 
seems like kind of a minor thing to include, but once again, Mark doesn't include stuff that's not important. So if we understand the cultural background of what a cloak meant to somebody in this time, it makes a lot more sense. And it was actually a really big deal what happened here. So really three things. The cloak was first, their protection. Um, so it was the outer garment that would be used to keep themselves warm at night. And, uh, and to keep the cold off. In fact, this garment was so important to the ancient Israelites that the law of Moses required that if a poor person gave up their cloak as security on the loan, then they couldn't keep it overnight. That's what Deuteronomy 24 says. It says you need to return the cloak to its owner by sunset, so you can stay warm through the night and bless you, and the Lord your God will count you as righteous. So the cloak would have ser uh, served as their protection also serve as their provision now so uh you know people drop by drop coins on the ground well Bartimaeus can't see right so he can't see where they are so he would take that cloak stretch it across his lap and it became like a little bowl there in his lap and people would throw the money in and so it was his means of uh, providing for himself so he collected and so then the last thing is specifically for Bartimaeus that his cloak was a symbol of his old age of life and he chose to throw it aside he wasn't holding on to it just in case he didn't say when he was called wait let me gather up my money and put it in my pocket then i'll come or wrap it around me or gather my stuff up it's not what happened he jumped up threw it off and tossed it away confident that he would no longer need it and jesus greets this expectant man with a question what do you want me to do for you jesus asked him now Seems overly obvious, right? You just ask anybody along the way, oh, Jesus, why are you asking that? Don't you know he wants to see? <laughs> but uh, Jesus was not asking for information. Um, I think we get more of what he was really getting after when we realize this is the exact same question that he asked, Peter, uh, asked James and John last week, right? <laughs> and a similar dynamic of what he was talking to with the rich young ruler, like we were talking about earlier. Um, so the, though Jesus doesn't ask that guy a question, the rich man did want something from Jesus, right? Remember, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was looking for a guarantee. He was asking him a validation from Jesus that he, that he would get what he wanted, right? In other words, he said, I want you, you to do for me, Jesus, is to give me assurance that my efforts are enough. That's what he's asking Jesus. James and John wanted the same thing. He says, Jesus, give us what we want. That is, I want to be, uh, have prominence and position and power in this life. That is, assure us of what our future will be like. And both the sons of Zebedee and the rich young ruler went away with their request unfulfilled. And yet, look what happened to Bartimaeus. Go, he said. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight. So notice that the healing is the result of Jesus' intervention and his faith. Faith does not happen for this man after he gets what he wants. He is confident that Jesus is the Messiah before he ever shows up. He, and so he, he already has faith in Jesus. And the healing of this beggar illustrates the way which, so that we lay hold of the things that God w wants to provide for us. And we need to come to Jesus confident that he was able to save, able, confident he's able to provide, protect, and transform. And so faith is the channel through which the goodness of God's flows. Now, don't get nervous and go, uh-oh, she's going faith on us. And that's not the case because uh, he, he doesn't mean that God's going to give you whatever you want. That's not the case. Faith is not a lasso that we can take and swing around and throw it around God's neck and make him do whatever you want. Let me remind you that there is nothing you can do to get God to do something that is not his will. Not pray, not fast, not try to use faith like some kind of a force to, to force him to do what you want him to do. It doesn't happen. It won't happen, and you will be sadly disappointed if you try to go that route because it is not a secret code that you try to figure out to make God to do your will. It's not going to happen. It is a futile quest. It's like the illustration from the movie. You are drinking from the wrong cup, and it will not 
satisfy you. But faith is a critical part of seeing God move in your life and do powerful things. I mean, we must believe that he is who he says he is and can do what he promises, just like it says in Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe what? Not that you get what you want. Believe that he exists. So we believe in him. We, it, it's key that you have to believe not God's going to do what you want him to do and give you a bunch of stuff. You believe in him as it is revealed in scripture. So we believe in him regardless of what he does or doesn't do. It's just what the faith that Bartimaeus had. He believed Jesus was the Messiah, son of David, even if he had walked right by him. He already had faith in who Jesus was, regardless of what that interaction was with him there on the road. And remember that though Bartimaeus is a real person, it also foreshadows what Jesus does for every person who cries out to him in faith. He opens our blind eyes, and sometimes we get so focused on the things that are temporary in this world, like jobs and relationships and health and all that stuff that we forget to value the miracles that we already do have. And all of us who are believers have our blind eyes open. Our deaf ears are healed. Our lame legs are strengthened. And our dead spirits are made alive, just like Ephesians chapter 2 says. And this is an absolute miracle that each one of us possesses, but we tend to be sometimes like ungrateful teenagers and go, yeah, I know you saved my soul and that you provide for me and that you made me a place in heaven, but I'm mad because this thing over here didn't work out the way I want it to. We need to, we as believers need to learn to appreciate and respect what is important and what truly has value. And every time, everything in this life burns. Everything that we worry about, everything that we angst over, everything that we put so much energy to, it is ashes. But what does matter is the souls of the people that we know and pass by, that's what matters. And instead of focusing in on what's temporary, we need to appreciate the things that God is interested in. Put our focus on the kingdom of God and what he wants. And so look what happens to Bartimaeus. Jesus tells him, says, go, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And Luke, the same uh, passage in Luke, tells us a little bit more what that looked like. He says he began following, glorifying God, and when all the people saw it, they praised God as well. So notice Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus doesn't just say thanks and head back to where he was, where he sat, and return to begging. He is forever Change, and I'm sure he never went back to that spot again. And this is a reminder uh, that faith in Jesus is the beginning of a brand new life, not just the end of an old one. Something took the place of sitting and begging for Bartimaeus, and that is following and praising. He got up, moved from where he was, and went behind Jesus. Isn't this what the picture of what our life should be like too? Not sitting in our old habits and attitudes and behaviors. A life of trust in Jesus demands that we change. If we're still at the same place where we are when we were saved 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, still wrestling with the same old things, then has Jesus touched your life to begin with? Do you really know who he is? And what he's done for you, do you appreciate what that is? Because nothing is, is too much when you understand what he has done for us. There's a preacher that I like to listen to uh, who says this about his church. He says, it's okay to not be okay when you come here, but it's not okay to stay that way. We ought to if you bring, bring whatever, whatever you have, bring it to Jesus, but don't stay, hang on to it. Lay it down, get up, just like Bartimaeus, and move forward into your new life. And so, this ought to be us, you know? We don't get a pass on excusing the same stuff over and over and over again. Well, that's just the way I am. No! Belief ought to be followed by change. 
Not that we don't make some of the same mistakes and have patterns that we have to wrestle against. We all have to do that. But it's important that we work through repentance. And true repentance is more than just feeling sorry for wrong actions. True repentance is agreeing those actions are wrong and moving in the right direction. You're agreeing with God. Okay, yes, that's what you say. I believe it. I'm, I'm going to leave that behind. And that may take a while. It may take a lot of work, a lot of prayer, somebody beside you to walk you through things. But without this critical second part of repentance, then repentance doesn't really happen. So you ought to be moving and following, just like Barton Mayus did. He got up, left that cloak behind, left his begging behind, followed Jesus, and praised God for everything he did. And the excitement about what God had done was contagious. He says that at the end of that Luke passage, that of the other people praised God, too. And if you're sitting here thinking, well, you know what, Barton Mayus, he got a miracle, right? I mean, Jesus didn't bring me my miracle. I prayed and prayed and prayed and, it, and asked and I got people to pray for me and it just didn't work out. I mean, it went from bad to worse. Things just got worse. And remember to put these things, what I'm talking about here is mostly in the spiritual, right? I mean, we all have disappointments. This is a broken world, right? Things happen and uh, they leave us broken hearted. Spiritually, these things, we need to think about it that way. Yes, does, Jesus does do miracles in the flesh and in this world, but once again, the greatest miracles that we've been given by Jesus are spiritual in nature. And they're the ones that last for eternity. They don't fade with age. They, we can count on them 100%. They are what our hours are given to us by Christ. And remember, when others see your faith, walking through difficult situations, in spite of your earthly challenges, that's an intention gift. That's an intention getter. People go, wait, why, why are you like that? Like when other, other people aren't. And the, when the crowd saw Bartimaeus, they praised God. That's easy to understand, big flashy miracle. But we get, we get to the more important point that helps carry us through from another story about Jesus heal, healing a blind man. And that's in John chapter 9. His disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man, his parents that he was born blind. This man was about 30 years old at the time. Neither this man or his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that work of God might be displayed in his life. And that's hard, right? But this man would spend three decades of his life blind so God's glory could be revealed. And the truth is that our brokenness, it's in our brokenness that allows the light of Jesus to shine through us in a dark world. See, we we'll all want that big, exciting miracle where Jesus fixes all the broken things and mends everything and, and you know, the story has a happily ever after, but rivet this in your mind, okay? It's just as much of a miracle of God to be sustained through adversity as it is to be delivered from it, okay? Miracles are wonderful. They are wonderful, but don't downplay the ongoing miracle that carries you through a difficult time maybe for years and years and years active every day all the time that is a miracle of god's work in your life too and i know some people in this very room right here have faced devastating tra tragedies dealt with personal pain pain that keeps going and pain associated with a loved one are people who've lost things that we can't even understand and deep hurt that no one really, really gets. But you're here. You're not crushed. You've not given up. You're still going. Still able to praise God, even in the midst of all of that. That is a miracle. That is a miracle of the grace of God every day. And probably nobody's going to call you up and ask, let me have an interview with you and put you on a, 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 a TV show and tell you how about this great thing that God did in your life, but my goodness, sometimes just getting up in the morning and making it to work is a work of the grace of God in your life. Please don't be dismissive of that or downplay it as if being rescued is, from a situation is the only miracle there is. 
okay? Sustained by the grace of God. Is equally a miraculous move of God. And some of you walk in it every single day and you don't even realize it. Don't even realize the immense grace that is flowing toward you. And remember that you have it every single moment. You breathe it in. He is sustaining you to walk every single day. Our lives, no matter what happens, whether we get the amazing miracle or we don't get the one that's big and flashy, we need to be about making Christ known in everything. In our smiles, our laughter, our hardship, our tears, in our hopeful confidence and faith, and even in our quiet doubts and fear. And that we don't like it, we pray hard against it. The truth is that the power of God is to spend sometimes the best through suffering and pain. That's what the scripture says. And you can look at those, look those verses up, but that's what it says. Is when somebody tells you that that's wrong, it's not. That's a lie. Okay? And this is once again where we need to value the spiritual over the earthly. Because if we know by enduring adversity well, someone may get to see the light of Jesus, then that should change how we walk in it. Well, God does not expect us to love pain. We need to realize that pain does make us more like Jesus. And how he can be the perfect place for his glory to be displayed. And when we understand that, it can make it a little easy, a little easier to get through the hard days. Because we can be confident that there is always purpose for pain. Always purpose for pain. God wastes nothing. He wastes nothing. He gets mileage out of everything if we'll give it to him. It's about God's glory and not mine. And our faith is the perfect place for God's glory to be displayed. Especially in the hard times. Especially when there's a lot of pain and suffering. And whether he, he ever heals in this life or not. I mean, following Jesus means dying to myself, surrendering to his will, no matter what that will might be. Remember from BBS to song Jesus first, me second? Really easy to sing, harder to live, right? That's the point of the story of a rich young ruler, James and John, in contrast with Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was desperate. He had nothing left. He knew all that he had was Jesus to help him. And that's where the, both the sons of Zebedee and the rich young ruler failed. They didn't really know what they needed. James and John thought they needed recognition and power and prestige. Jesus told them they needed to be servants. Rich young ruler wanted eternal life with God, but he didn't realize that his real God was his wealth. So the question we end tonight with is the same we saw in the verses today, and that is, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? How would you answer that question if Jesus was standing in front of you? Because the question is posed to you by him. But before you answer with that knee-jerk, earthbound thing that you want, the healing, the job, the relationship stuff, think carefully. Think really carefully. Because a lot of those things we ask for only last a little while, right? But think carefully. And just like from the movie, you can choose wisely. Mm -hmm. Amen? God, we just thank you that you are so patient with us as we struggle through all the things that just have our attention. God, give us the wisdom. Give us the insight from your word, from your Holy Spirit. Take a step back from all the things that cause so much emotion and just break our heart, that just breaks our heart. And help us to see what's really important, what will, will really last for eternity. And God, then help us to choose wisely what we ask for you. Because in your powerful name we pray. Amen.